said, Dennis, we were so busy and we had such a schedule that we really didn't have much time to do that. He said, I noticed it when we were on our way back, and that's when it hit me where I had been. Uh, one of the other astronauts uh, had a, quite a religious experience because of going there. One of the things that was publicized but ne never confirmed was when they went around the backside of the moon, a, a communication with NASA on a on a on a secret uh, transmission said there really is a Santa Claus, <laughs> which we believe meant that there was something on the backside of the moon, which we never see. And then there was also a report that when they were actually on the moon, there was a report that there was something or someone or some being watching them from a crater some distance away. I can't verify any of that, but those are some of the things we hear about the astronauts. That's great. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks, Thank Ryder. Take care. Bye-bye. Dennis, mm -hmm. I'm going to put the uh, website address out again in just a minute, so okay. it'll mention for everybody there. And I will answer emails if, they, if anybody wants to write to me. Okay. On the website. Okay. Well, talking about that, here's one... I think this is uh, from a guy in Bromley. It said, uh, does your investigator, what does he make of the claims of Bob Lazar, L-A-Z-A-R-R, -R, yeah. that, yeah. that he worked at Area 51 and reverse-engineered alien spacecraft a few years ago from Martin in Bromley? Bob Lazar is uh, a whole lot like Colonel Corso we talked about earlier with the, the book The Day After Roswell. He's one of them individuals I really would like to believe. But again... Doing this type of research requires validation, verification, and confirmation. And with Bob Lazar, we don't have it. He does not have the educational background that he says he has. Stanton Friedman, uh, the nuclear physicist and well-known UFO researcher, and I work together quite a bit. He has done extensive research on Bob Lazar and believes that he's a, a, a fraud. Uh, what he may be is a stooge for the government uh, put out information and then they'll make him look ridiculous uh, our government's known to do that Bob Lazar's education cannot be verified he's had a very very questionable few careers that he's been involved in I've talked to physicists who claim that he takes the physics to a certain point but can't take it far enough to explain his uh, knowledge of the, the elements uh, that were used for fuel. Uh, he did work at Los Alamos. We know he worked there. He's in the phone book as a technician, uh, paid by the Navy when he was working there. I have no records at all of him being at, uh, at Area 51 like he claims. I would like to believe him, but uh, unless I can come up with some verification and some confirmation to the claims he makes, I'm going to have to, to leave him in the grey box with the rest of them. Uh, here's a question from Ernest in London. He said, uh, please ask Dennis whether or not he believes Jim Mars, that's M-A-R-R-S, claimed that the Iraq invasion was to secretly steal technology regarding time travel. I know it's not one of your four areas of interest, but... Um, I know Jim Mars, uh, he's a Texas boy, uh, pretty good researcher. He's done a lot of work on the, the Kennedy assassination. Uh, he also... One of the things I run into, Mike, on, on some of these researchers is what I call sensationalism. And I'm not into that. I guess maybe because of my engineering background, I just don't believe in it. Uh, I used to try to confront people that were putting out misinformation or disinformation, I tried to do it privately not to embarrass anyone, and that didn't work. So I started doing it publicly. If they're going to put out information that's not validated and, and you know have the public believing it, I'm going to call their hand on it. Uh, Jim does good work. Uh, overall, I would rate him as, as a good researcher. Right. Well, just leave it there then. Put a little full stop colour. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, you wanted to reach Dennis's website, it's www.truthseeker at roswell.com, all lowercase. In fact, I'll do it again before um, Dennis leaves us. 
Okay, uh, let's talk to Pandora, who's in Windsor. Hello, Pandora. Hello, Pandora. Something bizarre has happened there. We'll come back to that. She got abducted. Hello, Pandora. Yeah. We were calling your name, and you know, when the bell tolls, please. <laughs> we I'm thought here. you were abducted. Yes. <laughs> thought you'd gone. Thought you'd gone off somewhere. Hello, Pandora. <laughs> no, I'm right here listening to you. Okay, so uh, what would you like to ask, Dennis? Um, a couple of things. One is I've been hearing that um, in Mexico there was rumour that the government had actually come out and said we do acknowledge uh, extraterrestrials and we are going to build a landing strip somewhere in Mexico. Mm -hmm. I've heard that. Uh, uh, but, but then I never heard anything more about it. It's kind of like everything else with the UFO things, you know, people like the presidents. I, I mentioned earlier the presidents wanted to, to open this up and, and get information, and all of a sudden you don't hear anymore. Mm. The media will not pick it up. Here in the United States, this is not news. What is news here is Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton and uh, the Jackson. You know, those kind of things, I guess, are news for our media. Now, does that mean that the media is controlled by the government? I would hope not. But uh, it seems rather obvious that whenever anything is reported in the United States by the media, it's done in a tone that makes it look like it's just a big joke. And that's a big problem for, for us serious researchers. Now, as far as other countries revealing anything, the United States has been good over the years with foreign aid to all countries or most countries and they have that hammer they can hang over a country and say if you go public with this you know the goodies quit coming <laughs> the russians we thought when when the, the soviet union collapsed we really believed that we could go in there and look at the the kgb files and possibly get some information as it turned out we understand the cia went in there before anybody else mm. and we haven't been able to get much information out of them either. Right. By the way, on the back of Pandora's question, and the line's still open, Pandora, so okay. feel free to jump in if you want. Right. I did read that Japan had built a landing strip oh. um, expressly well, for... Um, several countries have. Uh, we've had one guy here in, in the United States that claimed that he was going to put a landing strip and lights and all this stuff, you know, and I... I take it with a grain of salt uh, mm -hmm. SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and that is to me a big waste of money because they're looking for radio signals and any civilization that can get here would be so far advanced of us that radio certainly wouldn't be their method of communication uh, you know if, if they can get here and I'm going to use the word if I'm not going to say they do but if they can get here they have technology and knowledge that we cannot even comprehend. And like with the Roswell craft, if we captured a craft, I believe that we're still trying to figure out what it is, how it works, and where it came from. And until our government gets a military advantage out of that, they will not go public with it. Because we don't use anything in our daily life here that the military hasn't already used. I've recently heard that military technology advances about 15 or 20 years for every calendar year, meaning that they're that far ahead in technology. And, and everything we use in our daily life, the military has already used. So until they get the military advantage out of any crash craft or beings or, or whatever, they're not going to go public with it. Thanks, Pandora. We've got a couple of people uh, to speak to before it's, uh, it's time for us to part, but uh, I'm just going to ask you, Dennis, and I'm doing it in front of a few witnesses. <laughs> maybe, okay. maybe you'll come back and spend some time with us again? I'd love to. Okay. Um, we're going to zip through some of these calls, so I think what we'll do, we'll take a break, and um, then we'll get to speak with uh, Barry, who's been with us such a long time, he's on the pension scheme, Andy and Bolton and Spence in Coventry, uh, and Colin and Samantha. I'm Mike Allen, this is TalkSport. 
John Gorshan. Hey, it's Gaunty. Weekday mornings from 10. The man with his finger on the pulse of the nation. And the prognosis ain't looking good. Every single caller at the moment who's rang in is against me. A family man. I'm not getting down because I'm not wearing the thong. With a national agenda. And a jag in case you've heard it. Oh my God, that's with the horse hair shirt and the whip. The John Gaunshan. Pay attention. Weekday mornings from 10. On 10.89 and 10.53 a.m. Talk Spoke. Yes, baby. Irrascible. A string of no. Irreverent. Are you having a laugh? Irritating emissions. <laughs> Ever considered a career as a talk sport presenter? The experts across the UK on 1089 and 1053 AM. And Hello, buddy. on the engineering apocalypse that is DAB Digital Radio. Nothing worse than a bent periphery. Talk Sport. Next Frontier Night on Talk Sport. I'm Mike Allen. Dennis G. Bolfauser is with us and uh, he's a UFO investigator, researcher and lecturer. You are delighted to be speaking to him. Of course you are. Barry in Tyne and Weir. Sorry to keep you waiting for such a long time, Barry. No worries. I was oh. 17 when I called. <laughs> he was 17 when you called. He's now on the phone. Yeah, I'm 40 screen. now. <laughs> 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 well, Dennis is here. What would you like to ask him? Well, um, well, one of the things I wanted to ask was, um, I heard, is is it, um, Mac Brazel? Was that the name of the rancher? Dennis? Mac Brazel, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, apparently he took some material from the, uh, the crash site back right. to his family, and apparently he could crush it and it would spread out again, he couldn't burn it, he couldn't break it. Right. What's, what's, what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, today we have a material, we being the military, has a material they call memory material. And it's a, to me, it's a, a good indication where they may have got that. Uh, the material you're talking about, he, he, the rancher, Mac Brazil, described three types of material. And also Jesse Marcel, the intelligence officer, and his son, uh, Jesse was the intelligence officer of the 509th, and when he went out to the debris field with the rancher, on the way back to the house, he stopped at the house and woke his wife and seven-year-old Jesse Jr. up and put some of this material in the kitchen on the floor. And one of the materials, you could crumble it up, and in a few seconds it would actually go back to its original shape and have no indication of ever being crumbled up or folded. Mm -hmm. The other material was a material like plastic or bakelite, which they didn't have in 47, and then the I-beams, which were small I-beams about the, the weight of balsa wood, very light, and had writing on them that looked like hieroglyphics. I have taken some of the, the writing, some of the symbols that uh, Jesse Jr. remembered under hypnosis, and run them by some of our people with the, the Pyramid Association, and they cannot see any connection at all with hieroglyphics on it. But those were the three materials. Now the ranch foreman had found the material the next morning after a thunderstorm when he went out to check on his sheep and cattle from the storm and his windmills and brought some of the material to a neighbor and they tried to cut it with a pocket knife. They tried to burn it with a cigarette lighter and then the other material that crumbled up. So you have your information correct about what the, the rancher found. Did you just say Jesse Marcel Jr.? Yes. Right. It's very interesting because, uh, thanks very much, Barry. Thank you. Uh, I just got an email. So I thought I'm reading this name and I'm hearing it. And I wasn't quite sure if I was even reading it. Jesse now. Marcel Jr. is probably close to 70 years old. He just got back from Afghanistan. Right, because this is from Graham, as in Graham Parsons. Uh, Jesse Marcel Jr. says Graham. That's the son of the guy in the photos holding the alleged Roswell weather That's balloon correct. debris. Uh, is alive and serving as a medic in Iraq, confirmed he, to me by Stanton Friedman. Jesse Jr. was a medical doctor in Helena, Montana, where he lived, and uh, he's a helicopter pilot. He's an aircraft crash investigator has pretty high credentials for military involvement and was asked to go into the military at the age of some 60 years old, went to Afghanistan, and he came back. I saw him last July, uh, was thinking about going back again, and is currently writing a book, which I'm very anxious to, to get a copy of. Right. Jesse Jr. is probably one of the better witnesses that's still alive 
related to the Roswell incident, and I say still alive because we're losing them very quickly. Uh, the guys that were involved in 1947 or in their late 70s, early 80s, if they're still alive. I'm currently working on a witness who claims that he was a pilot that flew some of the material to Wright Field, to Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Believe, unbelievably, he lives about 30 miles from me, and I just found out about him. And uh, his military records were destroyed in a fire in his in his house, and that's the way I got in t contact with him. And I'm going to go ahead and try and get his military records again, and do an in-depth interview with him. He claims that he was doing the Pacific run with C-54 aircraft in 45 and 46 for about eight years running the Pacific cargo run for the military and had a load out of Hawaii that he was told to drop in California and report to Roswell. When he got here, he was loaded up. He flew to Ohio to Wright-Patterson Field. There was another aircraft in the hangar. They put him in the hangar, unloaded him, told him to report back to California, and he never made that trip. So I'm going to try to verify some of that information. Okay. From the same email is a subsequent question on a different subject, I believe, says Graham. For, uh, I believe from my evidence that the U.S. is involved in a technology exchange for certain favors deal with alien species. And I've seen UFOs, he said, during a significant period in 98. Is there any gossip around that time? That yes, there, there's also been several reports that uh, President Eisenhower went to Palm Springs, California, and on vacation, and supposedly met with, prearranged meeting with aliens, and made a deal where they could abduct individuals as long as they were returned and had no memory of what had taken place in exchange for technology. That's far-fetched, but that's one of the reports we've heard. Eisenhower was missing for a, a period of time during that trip, and the media was told that he had a dental appointment. Uh, and in fact, we believe that he went to Muroc, which was today is Edwards Air Force Base, to have this meeting. If he did, he violated the Constitution of the United States by making an agreement with a foreign organization without permission of Congress. Interesting. Andy's in Bolton. He wants to have a word with you before we part. Okay. Hello, Andy. Hi, Mike. Uh, Hi. Ian. First of all, I'm, I've not found him to put anybody down. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating radio. And, yeah, I'm, I, I would honestly say when I stare out and look at the stars at night, and, you know, I try to realise how big the galaxy could be, that we, it, it, yeah, I, you know, I, it'd be a, I think it'd be stupid to assume we're, we're just on our own. And I don't doubt that, t to some extent, if other people uh, on another planet somewhere have got this technology, they've, they've come, they've visited us and they've gone away. But what I wanted to ask, you were talking about the Sphinx and the pyramids, which I'm quite fascinated with, but I'm no builder. You know, I can't even knock a nail in the wood. But aren't, by looking back at it, aren't you underestimating humankind itself? I mean, even in, you know, I don't have to go back to the pyramids. You've only got to, we have a, a local steeplejack who's quite well known on TV, Fred Dibner. And on his series, he shows you how bridges were built, he shows you how railway bridges were built, tunnels were built, canals. And I look at that even now, and that's what, two, three hundred, and I think, my God, where, like, how did they do it? You know, how did they build the railway tunnels, how did the, the local canal? You know, they have no proper cranes, no... Uh, I look at fantastic, say, the Humber Bridge. It's a fan when I first ever saw that a few years, I couldn't believe how big it was. But aren't you talking a hundred, maybe? You know, are maybe? you underestimating human technology? I mean, even the phone that I'm using now, I've not got a blooming clue how it works. But somebody out there does know. And I think, you know, to say that we were visited by aliens, I mean, I'll, I regularly go to Wales, I'll name the place, I did know, and on top of the, the, the big uh, mountain known as the Great Arm, and on top of there, there's a copper mine. And if you read the history of it, 4,000 years BC, there was a tribe that lived on top of it that were uh, suddenly found out to make copper out of a substance in the rocks, and they were making swords. And you know, I, you know, the Sphinx, you know, the Mavs. I'm, uh, you know, me, me stepfather was, was based in, um, in Egypt, and he tells me about it. But I'm, it, it, I mean, don't get me wrong, you're fascinating what I'm hearing. But I look at the Victorians and think, how on earth did they build, you know, the Menai Bridge? Who came mm -hmm. up with that idea? How They didn't know. It just took people with a lot of foresight, mathematicians, architects, 
uh, you know, air flights. I mean, you know, you, the, I've often uh, these stealth bombers with this Roswell thing, rubbish. But when you look at the technology 100 years ago for flight, I live basically on a flight path, and I see these great big 747s going over every, every night they do it. And I think, you know, who thought of that? And I think really sometimes... We're, we're underestimating the power of our own intelligence. I think humans, you know, it's fantastic. The, 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 the basic everyday things that we take for granted. Somebody somewhere thought of the idea. Okay. So, uh, uh, a whole lot of information right there. Yes, <laughs> I, I appreciate... So you want me to send comments. out for breakfast for you here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, we have people alive today that have lived from the time of the Wright brothers' first flight through going to the moon in that time period, their, in their lifetime. Uh, on the pyramids, I said earlier that I believe there's about 80 or 85 pyramids in Egypt. There's also pyramids in other countries. Mexico has some in other, other countries. If you will look at every pyramid in Egypt other than the three at Giza, they're poor replicas of the ones in Giza. They don't compare in technology, in size, in workmanship, and accuracy. Now, as far as the tools, they had primitive tools compared to what we have today. Our PBS station, our, our PBS network, several years ago tried to duplicate the pyramids, building the pyramids, in a smaller scale. They failed miserably. They wound up bringing in cranes and front-end loaders and different types of heavy equipment to do it. I said earlier that the time frame that we've been given by Egyptologists for the building of the pyramids would mean that a stone had to be placed every 90 seconds, and that's up to 454 feet in the air. I don't see, with my background in civil engineering, how that's possible. Uh, his comment about looking out in the stars and thinking maybe, you know, how big is that? I think it'd be egotistical to think that we're the only thing in this universe. Uh, from a Christian standpoint, uh, I don't have a problem with it either. So, you know, I, I just think there's more to us than, than we know. And I think that humans are pretty egotistical, and we're not necessarily the smartest kids in the universe. If anybody can get here from anywhere else, we're not up with them because we can't go there we can't even get to mars on a regular basis so technolo technologically uh we're way behind any being or any civilization that could get here scientists have started to admit that there is probably life in the universe other life in the universe what bothers me about the scientists is they always say life as we know it that's the get-out clause, isn't it, as we know it? Where in the rule book does it have to be like we know it? We're limited as humans. Our brain capacity is limited. So unless we've experienced it, we're more than likely we're not going to believe it. Is but there... I have a major problem with, with the scientists on that comment. Is there any chance, Dennis, I could ask a kindness, and could you just take uh, a couple more calls after the news? Sure. Okay, that'll be great. You're listening to TalkSport. Dennis G. Bolthouse is with us. He's a UFO investigator, researcher, and lecturer. And we've been a delight just to uh, have his company on the air, direct from America. So, later on, more delights to come. Yes, actually. Henry Asgar Kelly is going to be sharing with us his thoughts on the devil. He's been actually uh, involved in compiling this book, The Devil's Biographer. And you know the spelling is rubbish. Dennis Bolthez is with us. We're going to be uh, taking up the remainder of the calls that are on the switchboard. So if you're in there and you've been speaking earlier to George, uh, we will speak to you before uh, Dennis leaves us. A lot of people asking for a refresher on Dennis's website. It's truthseeker at roswell.com. Truthseeker at roswell.com. This is Talk Sport. I'm Mike Allen. Much more to come. And also more about Satan. Really? On 1089 and 1053 AM I declare that the person elected Around the world We need to build a bridge